service today, we are officially in what is known in the church calendar as ordinary time. Doesn't that sound exciting? Ordinary time. <laughs> Thrilling. <laughs> exciting. Well, it can be. And I think uh, this, this time of the uh, church calendar, the lessons are focused more on uh, Jesus' teaching. Less about these high moments of celebration in his life and these festival days, and more about just what are the basic things that he taught. And so through the summer months, we'll, uh, we'll hear some of these, uh, these lessons. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Jesus said to the twelve, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave to be like the master. If they have called the master of the house the Azelbub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the mountaintops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have, come not, I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be a member of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours this day. Through Christ, our Savior and Lord. There's an old joke that says that a bald head is like heaven. There's no parting there. <laughs> When you hear that the, today's lesson says that all the hairs on your head are counted, you start thinking of one-liners like this, about baldness, about hair. Couldn't help but speculate that some of the people listening to Jesus that day maybe had their gleaming pate in the desert sun. I don't know. Maybe they had a little uh, thinning on top, and that's what brought this to mind for Jesus, that God knows the number of hairs in our head. Actually, if you have a bald head and don't want to go through any of the currently available Methods of reforestation, typically summed up as drugs, rugs, or plugs, you may be better to simply embrace your baldness. It's become kind of trendy, actually. I guess that's what John Caps has done. Caps is uh, described as a, the founder, oh, he's described as one who could pass as a stunt double for Mr. Clean, and he's founded an organization called Bald Headed Men of America, an organization with over 35,000 members in. 50 states and 39 countries. The organization holds a convention every September in where else? Moorhead, North Carolina. <laughs> Three day event features clinics on bald head care and awards for the sexiest bald head, the most improved bald head, I don't quite know what that means, the most distinguished bald head, and so on. Of course, it doesn't hurt that one of the benefits is having very attractive women as the judging panel, and they come and feel the scalp. It's part of the process for determining the winners. Well, again, in our text, Jesus says that all the hairs on our head are counted. Now, on some heads, it's a little easier to count than others, of course. But Jesus wasn't trying to be funny. He was talking about some very serious matters, some very worrisome things to his original hearers. Certainly more than a receding hairline. He was talking about the dangers of the world that we live in, the difficulties and stresses that we live in, we live with on a very, very real way on a daily basis. Like in his days, in his day, the original hearers were afraid of the religious authorities. 
the authorities who could have people arrested for not following the law to the letter. Or maybe they were fearful of being imprisoned. And those centurions standing guard on the corners. I don't know if you've had that experience of traveling a third world country. When you see the military standing around with automatic weapons, that's not something I'm used to seeing, and it's a little unsettling. That's the feeling that they would have had in the ancient world, too. People walking the streets, seeing a centurion, there is a deadly warrior, and he's just feet away. He knows a zillion ways that he could take my life. And he's working for somebody else and not too worried about my life. That's a very real worry. These were the fears that people were living with. The things that we fear today are uh, obviously a little bit different, but uh, maybe have some similarities. There was a study done in 85 by Psychology Today magazine. Obviously, 85 was a number of years ago. And these were the, fear the top three fears listed uh, among 1,000 people. Death of a loved one, serious illness, and there was a tie for a third place between financial worries and nuclear war. So they, uh, another study was done recently online uh, in 2008. Well, not that recently, but the, the top three were listed as the Iraq War, the dwindling middle class, and global warming. Now, obviously things have changed a little bit, but and it'd be interesting to, to maybe take a poll here and see what some of the top worries may be. Some of these worries are global. Some of these worries are very national. We worry about our own government and our own house here. Some of our biggest worries are very personal. Worrying about our own family and our own health. Regardless, these fears are, uh, there, there's some commonality over the years, some consistency. And the interesting thing about our lesson today is that Jesus faces folks who are nervous, living in a world with very real worries, and he says, do not fear. He doesn't just say this once. He says it to them three times in verses 26, 28, and 31. He says, do not fear. Do not be afraid. What's the first thing he said to the disciples after he rose from the grave? Do not be afraid. It's one of the most fundamental things that Jesus says to his followers. Don't worry. I remember when that song came out by Bobby McFerrin, Don't Worry, Be Happy. I hated that song. <laughs> I'll be honest. I did not care for that song. I thought, that feels ridiculous. Don't worry. Be happy. You know, and I'm thinking, what about people who have real concerns, have real worries? Is he just kind of glossing over those, being naive to those things? Well, Jesus certainly was not being naive to the real world troubles. He was right in the thick of it. He was right in the midst of being accused and condemned by the authorities. He knew those dangers. But what he also knew was confidence and trust in his Heavenly Father. And that's what grounded him. That's what helped him not to worry so much about dangerous centurions, not to worry so much about religious authorities and, and all of their rules and regulations, not to worry so much even about his own life. Because he knew he was in God's hands. And so one of the most fundamental things he says to us, his followers, is fear not. Try not to worry. But trust. Trust that God is with you. So what does that kind of trust look like? What does that kind of faith look like? The fields were parched and brown from lack of rain. And the crops lay wilting from thirst. People were anxious and irritable as they searched the sky for any sign of relief. Days turned into arid weeks and no rain came. The ministers of the local churches called for an hour of prayer on the town square the following Saturday. They requested that everyone bring an object of faith for inspiration. At high noon on the appointed Saturday, the townspeople turned out en masse filling the square with anxious faces and hopeful hearts. The ministers were touched to see the variety of, of objects clutched in prayerful hands. They saw holy books, crosses, rosaries. When the hour ended, as if on magical command, a soft rain began to fall. 
Cheers swept the crowd as they held their treasured objects, high in gratitude and praise. Yet from the middle of the crowd, one faith symbol seemed to overshadow all the others. A small nine-year-old girl had brought an umbrella. There are a lot of reasons in the world to worry. But what would it look like if we really live from a place of faith? If we really trust that God is with us? And that God's plan is being unfolded in our lives? And that we are part of a bigger picture? What would it look like if we had that kind of trust? It may not be what we thought. Our lives often go in directions that we didn't expect. But what if we can say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I'm in your hands, and I know you're with me. God knows our circumstances. God knows our worries and our needs, intimately. Even down to those ridiculous details, like how many hairs are on our head, apparently. So I was thinking about this. Uh, I think... You know, faith is, uh, faith, faith is lived out in the real world. And I was thinking about that this week, that, you know, God made flesh. Jesus coming to earth, he could have lived in an unbelievable palace made of carnelian and topaz and gold and silver and I don't know. But he didn't. He lived a pretty mundane life. Because I think that's really where a lot of us live, is in pretty ordinary Places and deal with some pretty mundane kind of stuff throughout the week. So I was thinking about that, this verse and the fact that God meets us in our ordinary moments, in our mundane places, in our menial tasks. So I've got a, a ridiculous idea to pose to you. If you're like me, you have a hairbrush that doesn't get cleaned out often enough. I try to clean it out periodically, but to be honest, it's not high on my list of priorities. <laughs> so here's my challenge. Tonight, clean out the hairbrush. And keep this verse in mind. That God knows the number of hairs on our head. And before you throw out that nasty, ratty hairball, have a prayer. Something along these lines. Lord, you know my messes. You know the details. I trust that you are with me. Your holy word says you even know how many hairs are on my head, so I'm going to trust that you know every last detail of my life. And that you know what's best for me. Help me to clean up the mess and to trust that you will see me through it. That all the tangles and snares, Lord, that you will see me through. See me through these ordinary moments. See me all the way to your perfect kingdom in heaven. And God, thank you for being with me through.